more of the, especially the younger people, just having reached about 33% of the 18 plus uh, on a daily basis, we have moved from just approaching 300,000 vaccinations per day to now less than 100,000 per day. So it is a struggle, but the struggle continues. So thanks for your support. At least today we're not uh, in this country, the struggle is not about access. Uh, as you could see this example here of the uh, vaccinations going to the people, which is what as a team nationally we have agreed upon. This is happening all over in the in the shopping malls, in the taxis and, and everywhere. So our struggle today is to overcome hesitancy, especially of the young people and overcome the negative uh, uh, information they are bombarded with on a daily basis. On the other side of the coin, of course, as uh, we have seen here at, at uh, this facility, that at Seri, we see also the advancement, in also thanks to your support, um, and also the support of uh, other for, uh, multilateral organizations um, in terms of us being able now to can uh, participate at the high level of science in terms of research, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, genomics, uh, sequencing, and, and also the production of the mRNA vaccines. So we say thank you to, to, to all of you for, for your support and participation that today at least we can be able to showcase this. So we hope that uh, uh, the delegation, we hope this has been a really very, you know, useful, you know, experience for you and you'll be able to give your reflections later on but uh, thank you very much for taking this time to come and be with us thank you tg thank you very much uh, minister so i now like to humbly request uh, the deputy minister of higher education science and innovation mr budiman amela for his remarks um thank you very much uh, our director general um let me let me firstly uh, really acknowledge the uh, Director General of the World, World Health Organization for um, I think visiting uh, South Africa uh, and also to uh, have taken your time I think to go and see the various projects that were involved into but in particular. Uh, which is at the heart of uh, your your visit, our efforts towards uh, vaccine uh, production, as you've seen at Afrigen and as you'll see tomorrow uh, at BioVac, uh, the capacity that we've built. And I think the commitment of the World Health Organization to ensure that we support this initiative. And despite the many interests that were expressed all over the world, uh, that you saw it befitting that South Africa should be the host uh, of uh, the uh, Afri African project. Um, and I think more importantly, uh, the fact that uh, that uh, uh, project is not only for the benefit of our country, but also of the continent at large. I think we have uh, uh, had a, uh, a situation uh, in the recent past uh, where we've been talking about uh, vaccine sovereignty, vaccine hogging, um, prices uh, uh, being uh, manipulated and therefore access being limited. And we believe that this intervention will go a long way way in uh, ensuring that uh, there is uh, uh, you know vaccination in the uh, in the continent at reasonable cost uh, at quality but also at uh, uh, local uh, uh, production so we really appreciate your support, but also the support uh, of many uh, uh, countries that have, uh, uh, you know, not only uh, supported through word, but through action and through resources, uh, Belgium being uh, one of them. Uh, and I think you'd recall sometime last year when the French president uh, uh, came to our show and the kind of commitments that have been made. Uh, and we think that, uh, you know, this intervention will go a long way, not only for COVID, 
COVID-19, uh, but also for, uh, you know, for tuberculosis, uh, for HIV AIDS, uh, and for the many other, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 diseases that, uh, uh, you know, we are confronted with in the uh, country and in the continent. So, so we really want to appreciate uh, your, your visit, uh, uh, Director General, and I think as the uh, president indicated earlier on in your meeting with him uh, that government is committed to support uh, this initiative and also to continue working together with the World Health Organization, um, uh, you know, in all the work uh, that uh, uh, that we do. But I think we also need to, uh, uh, you know, express acknowledgement to the work that our many scientists have been doing in our institutions. I know we uh, are here at Stellenbosch University, but this is just but part of the many uh, 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 projects in our different institutions of higher learning, uh, you know, that are focused on really understanding the uh, uh, the virus um, and also, um, you know, contributing into the uh, body of knowledge uh, over the uh, last uh, two years or so. Uh, so our higher education institutions have done quite uh, uh, tremendous work uh, in contributing to, uh, you know, the world's knowledge. We really want to applaud our scientists, uh, not only here in Stellenbosch, um, you know, in University of KwaZulu-Natal, uh, at Rhodes, at Wirtz, and everywhere else where, uh, you know, our institutions of higher learning have really made a major contribution. Uh, but and we also know that it is because of our capacity and or the capacity of our education institution which uh, put us uh, way ahead uh, of uh, many other countries who wanted to host uh, you know this uh, vaccine uh, capacity uh, and uh, you know uh, i know it is the uh, commitment uh, and uh, vision of our minister to ensure that not only our universities play this role into the future but the kind of uh, skills that 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 should be coming from our uh, TVET colleges uh, and everywhere else, uh, you know, to help uh, with uh, uh, our uh, fight against uh, uh, COVID-19. We think that, yes, there is a big challenge, as, uh, as Minister of Health indicated, with, uh, with vaccination. Um, you know, our universities will be reopening, uh, most of them. Uh, students will be welcome on campus. Uh, some uh, Tibet colleges have already opened on campus, uh, and there's been the big debate about, uh, you know, mandatory vaccination, uh, you know, and all of that. And we are obviously finalizing discussions and guidelines in that regard. Uh, but what, what we think is important is the uh, fact that we have to work with uh, all stakeholders on campus to ensure that uh, uh, you know uh, we have as many people vaccinated as possible. I think the uh, focus and energy on um, uh, you know uh, mostly uh, entertaining those who are trying to uh, pull us back uh, from the progress that we've made when the vaccination program started, uh, you know, would be uh, well probably not a way but we think our energies should actually be much more focused on working with students' organizations, on working with the trade unions, and on working with everybody else uh, to make sure that we uh, increase the numbers of those who uh, have vaccinated. One of our agencies, which is Higher Health, um, has conducted some surveys uh, late last year, and we've uh, witnessed that uh, it's now uh, we're flirting with around 60% of students in our our higher education institutions who are vaccinated. Uh, and we think uh, obviously there will be new uh, entrants into the higher education and training space. Uh, and those are some of the people that we'll be focusing on uh, with our uh, vaccination campaign, working together with uh, the uh, Department of Health and all stakeholders. Our intention 
is not to exclude anybody from our universities and our TVET colleges on the basis that they are not vaccinated. Our intention is to ensure that we save lives um, and in the process, uh, you know, expand access to, uh, you know, to higher education. So, 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 so I think that it's important that we we, we really make uh, that. Uh, um, you know that uh, uh, that emphasis, and I think finally, uh, uh, you know, the um, uh, earlier on we we have indicated that. Uh, uh, or, uh, I think uh, Professor Tulo indicated that one of the most important elements of our success in responding to the uh, vaccine, uh, the fourth element is the uh, political will and political support. And I think our government remains committed to that, uh, be it uh, providing uh, or um, uh, you know guaranteeing the democratic space uh, within which. Uh, uh, you know, scientists could do their work, uh, but also more importantly, ensuring that we uh, commit resources, uh, uh, but also continued interaction and confidence with the work that uh, our scientists have been doing. And we are going to continue to do that uh, to support all this work that has been uh, uh, done uh, by our scientists in order to ensure that these uh, projects become a success. So we're looking forward to see you again, uh, Director General, uh, in the near future <laughs> when progress is made uh, in this regard. Thank you very much. It is again my my honor and my pleasure to request the Honorable Minister, uh, Ms. Miriam Kiti, uh, who is the Belgian Minister of Development, Cooperation and Urban Policy, uh, to give her remarks, uh, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much. Um, I think this thing is working. Yes, for now. Thank you very much, uh, dear Minister, dear Director General, dear Directors, dear Doctors, dear Colleagues, dear Press. Good afternoon. I am very, very pleased to be here and to witness the rich expertise in South Africa. The people here have done a really great job in the fight against the coronavirus. I followed the work of Afrigan with a great deal of respect, and I hope we can use this breakout as the starting point of the end of the pandemic worldwide. So let us put our hands together as partners and continue to win this fight. To me, it is very important to ensure we exchange knowledge on the global level. This is a global pandemic. So handling as business as usual is not a possibility. We are all in this together, and only together we can make a difference, globally and locally. If the pandemic has proven us one thing, it is that only unity and international solidarity will enable us to successfully stop this pandemic. It has shown us once again that we are all interconnected. So therefore, vaccination, vaccination the world against COVID-19 should be a top priority and remain so. So we must keep reminding ourselves of the reason for ensuring vaccination of the entire world. Because no one is safe until everyone is safe. So what happens here has an impact elsewhere and the other way around. And so we need to make sure that everyone across the world has access to vaccination. It is simply not acceptable that at this point, only 10% of the people in Africa have been fully vaccinated simply because they do not have access to a vaccine. And in low income countries, it is even less, 5%. So we can and we have to do better. Since the breakout of this pandemic, vaccine equity has been a purpose of fight, of fight for by providing real solutions, by providing real solutions. At first, at a short term, through support to COVAX, and later on, we supported through the sharing of vaccines with other countries. However, we must look beyond charity and seek structural solutions. Donations are still important, 
but more is required. And that is why I have invested in projects that increase the local productions of vaccines. And I am particularly proud, proud of these initiatives in South Africa, which is led by the WHO and supported by Belgium and our other European partners, such as France and Germany, whose ambassadors are among us today also here. It should be the aim of this innovative mRNA breakthrough to help meet the current vaccine gap. The success of our global recovery depends to a large measure on our ability to effectively fight the pandemic together. And that is exactly what this project is all about, to bring structural solution to local needs in a worldwide efforts. And let me finish by saying this. This initiative is showing the world how you fight, uh, how you solve the fight against inequality. Because more than one year, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a science, mm. I'm a politician, and I'm trying to find a structural solution. And more than one year, I, hear, I only heard what was not possible. And as a Minister of Development Cooperation, I'm very proud to be here and to witness these projects that makes my job unnecessary because that means they are finding a structural solution that means that they will be self-resilient and this project is not only a solution for south africa but for the whole continent so thank you very much for that because you have shown the, the world how it could be done yeah. you have shown the world how you can uh, how you can win the fight against inequality and thank you very much for that Thank you very much, uh, Minister uh, Maria Kitty. And our last contribution uh, will come from Dr. Tedros uh, Gabriesis, the DG of the World Health Organization. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Master of Ceremony, uh, Minister Fana, my friend, Minister Kittir, uh, Minister Manamela, uh, Professor Villers, uh, Professor Muller, um, Professor De Oliveira, and I saw uh, Petro, I think, somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Professor uh, Terblanche, um, uh, and dear colleagues and friends, and of course, ambassadors here present. Uh, good afternoon, and it's an honor uh, to be here. Two years ago, uh, the world was still coming to grips with the spread of a new coronavirus. WHO did what only WHO can do. We convened hundreds of scientists from around the world to identify the most urgent priorities in research and development. Among them was the development of vaccines. Tomorrow marks the second anniversary of that first meeting convened by WHO. It's incredible to think that within a year of that meeting, the first vaccines were approved. And just two years later, more than 10 billion doses have been administered globally. The development and approval of not one, but several vaccines in record time is an extraordinary scientific triumph that sets a new standard. There can be no doubt that vaccines have saved countless lives, are helping to turn the tide on the pandemic. That's why we're meeting in person after a long uh, jail and are now giving many countries the confidence to relax restrictions. But as you know, this scientific triumph has been marred by vast inequities in access. More than half of the world's population is now fully vaccinated. And yet, 84% of the population of Africa is yet to receive a single dose. 
much of this inequity has been driven by the fact that globally vaccine production is concentrated in a few mostly high income countries. One of the most obvious lessons of the pandemic, therefore, is the urgent need to increase local production of vaccines, especially in low and middle income countries. That's why in April last year, WHO issued a call for expression of interests for establishing a technology transfer hub for mRNA vaccines. The turnout of re applications was high, but South Africa was chosen as a hub for the mRNA because of several reasons. And the hub was established here in South Africa as a partnership between WHO, African Biologics, the Biologicals and Vaccines Institute of Southern Africa, or BioVec, the Southern African Medical Research Council, the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Medicines Patent Pool. We very much appreciate the strong support for the hub from Belgium, Canada, the European Union, France, Germany, and Norway. And it's already producing results yeah. with Afrigen's announcement last week that it has produced its own mRNA vaccine based on publicly available information about the composition of an existing vaccine. And when I met uh, Petra uh, this morning, I said, uh, considering all the developments, I said our baby is in good hands mm. and it will grow stronger. And it's a strong, a, a, a strategic solution for the problem that we're facing now. As you know, the mRNA technology is not just for COVID. It will be for malaria, TB, HIV, and the rest. It will be a game changer. And we expect this vaccine to be more suited to the context in which it will be used with fewer storage constraints and at a lower price. The medicines patent pool will manage the intellectual property and where necessary, issue licenses to manufacturers. Once a vaccine has been successfully developed, other manufacturers from around the world will be able to produce the vaccine for national and regional use. By the way, many of the countries who have asked to serve as a hub will be now a spoke since South Africa is the hub, then others will be the spoke and there will be a network of countries and institutions who will work together. We expect clinical trials to start in the first quarter of this year with approval expected in 2024. Spokes in other countries, as I said earlier, receiving the technology should be able to receive approval shortly thereafter. And the spokes are almost in each and every uh, region already. I congratulate Afrigen on this achievement. And WHO looks forward to supporting you as you take this vaccine candidate into clinical trials and beyond. And I congratulate South Africa on its leadership throughout the pandemic in hosting this mRNA technology transfer hub, <clears throat> in chairing the ACT Accelerator Facilitation Council, and in, in initiating a resolution at the World Trade Organization to temporarily suspend intellectual property rights for COVID-19 product, products. And President Ramaphosa's leadership was very clear continentally and also globally through his leadership in the ACT Accelerator Facilitation Council. Indeed, if the owners of mRNA vaccine technology share them with the hub, we could expedite manufacturing, removing the need for large clinical trials and cutting development and approval time by at least one year. Once again, I congratulate all those involved in bringing the mRNA technology transfer hub to this point, and I look forward to its further development. And the reason why South Africa was chosen is not only Afrigen or Biovac, but the presence of uh, this uh, university 
Stellen Bosch, and also BMRI and, and, and SERI. And of course, the rest of the ecosystem that can uh, support it. So we, we, we believe that uh, this commitment or the uh, capacity which we have in the country will make the project uh, successful. And the only option we have is success. And that's why we have to work hard. All partners that we have uh, met uh, today and some of them that we will be uh, meeting tomorrow. WHO remains committed to supporting the development of local manufacturing in Africa and around the world to increase regional health security and as part of our vision for the highest attainable standard of health for all people in all uh, nations. And we had a very good visit today, by the way, with the president. We have seen his commitment. I know he will continue to invest. And um, we had a very good discussion also with Minister of Health and Minister of uh, Education. We visited, of course, AfriGen, and we visited and met a very vibrant community, uh, Crossroads, uh, and Vaxi Taxi also. The incredible uh, invention and the commitment you see to serve the people, you, you, it, it's, it's very visible. And uh, we, we, we are really the first day of the visit. We're really encouraged by all that we have, we have seen. And uh, congratulations and uh, look forward to working with you even more closely to realize uh, the project. So thank you so much, MC, and uh, back to you. Thank you very much uh, to all the speakers and thanks, uh, TG. So we'll now have an opportunity um, for the questions and answers. We will try and see if we can take two rounds. Uh, the DG and the minister arrived late last night. So if I still want to work for this government, I will have to make sure that they have some time to work. So <laughs> please allow us to take just two rounds. We, we hope that will be enough. So there's a hand here. Please indicate which uh, uh, media house you come from and indicate who the question is for. So let's start with one, two, three, four. Uh, two questions. Um, the first is to DG Tita. DG, there's a big push uh, from the EU side um, as well, working together with the African Union to uh, operationalize the um, um, uh, African Assistance Agency. Um, how important is a, establishing a continental body such as this and whether it's much on the EU's example? How important is that? Is the WHO actively involved in setting up this agency? Um, and why is it necessary for the company? The second question is for Dr. Pasha, um, and it is related to the AMA. Uh, so Africa, uh, Nigeria, I think um, uh, Kenya, all FDT of all big economies, and I'm going to concentrate South Africa particularly now. You guys play the leading role, but you've not ratified the AMA treaty. Are you support about this? Why haven't you ratified it yet? When will you ratify it? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I think from Reuters. Wendell from Reuters. Okay, thank you guys. Wendell. Gary Cullen from Health Policy Watch in Geneva. Minister Katia, Belgium is known as a bi bi biotech leader, um, and some Belgian companies are already making mRNA vaccines. So, are any of them going to share their know how, and are you going to try to encourage them to do so? And Dr. Tedros, yesterday the BMJ published a really disturbing article about a company employed by BioNTech actively campaigning against the South African um, hub, <laughs> saying it's unlikely to be successful and it will infringe patents and instead promoting a fill and finish operation for the Pfizer vaccine, which involves no very little empowerment for South Africa. Can you comment on what looks like pharma dirty tricks to undermine the hub? Thank you.
Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Tedros. Uh, this question would be for you. What is the WHO position on uh, the pandemic at the moment? Is it too early to say that it could be moved into um, an epidemic? And dare I say it, is it time to unmask? And then for uh, the South African Minister of Health, I'd like to ask you, so Sinovac has been approved uh, for adult use in South Africa. Is this uh, good news? And could we actually see maybe more people getting vaccinated and trying to bring an end to also some hesitancy and also just opening up for other vaccines? Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Julie Shire from CGTN, China Global Television. Thank you. Friend number four, and then we'll try and respond and see if this is still up. Lawa from Channels TV, Lagos, Nigeria. My question is for Dr. Tedros. <clears throat> we have seen, we have seen along uh, across the countries anti-vax people protesting. Are you not looking at it that the booster shots keep coming? When is the booster shot going, going to be a final thing that, okay, this is the last booster shot we are going to take for this pandemic? That's the first one. Secondly, most countries are now dropping the use of face mask. What is WHO stand on that? as most African countries look for direction from WHO. Thank you. All right. Um, we will handle the question by asking either the minister or the DG. They are also accompanied by experts who may know uh, the details of the question. So I'll leave up to the ministers and all uh, the support they have brought for some of the questions. So maybe let's start uh, with uh, Minister Parsa on the question of the treaty, if you would like to do that. Uh, and then also the question about the um, response to the campaign against the hub. Um, if you would like to do that. And then the third question is uh, the Sinovac, uh, and is it good news and is going to assist? And then after that, we'll move to uh, the minister from Belgium. Uh, the one or two questions for her, uh, especially the companies in Belgium that are also in the mRNA, Big Pharma, and uh, what's their views on this work that is being proposed. Uh, and then uh, we'll end uh, with uh, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyes. Uh, a couple of questions from so let's start with Minister Park. Thank you very much, uh, DG, uh, Program Director. Um, we are fully uh, in support of uh, the African Medicines Agency. Um, what is left is really just our processes because uh, we do have particular lengthy process in terms of uh, approval of treaties. Um, it's got to be processed through our parliamentary process and, and uh, be approved. So what, what we will be following up is just to working with uh, colleagues in the, uh, our health committee um, and, and the presiding officers will, will be following up. Uh, but there is no in principle hesitation. It's, it's more really operational in terms of making sure that we, we do uh, sign the treaty on the African Medicines uh, Agency. Uh, as you would know that uh, our president um, has not been only leading in as far as the issue of access to vaccines, but also to diagnostics, to therapeutics. So uh, we can't, you know, uh, look left and turn right. Uh, so it's not going to happen. So we, we're very committed to a continental, you know, pan-African approach in terms of uh, sharing knowledge, uh, sharing resources and technical know-how. So uh, we will uh, be following up in terms of just making sure that this process is, is, is uh, concluded uh, up to our legislative uh, uh, processes. Um, 
uh, program director. I don't know whether you're saying I should also comment on the biotech issue. Um, I'm sure the minister will deal with that. Yes. Uh, from our side, I think it's, it would really be quite worrying if uh, uh, a company with whom we already have good relations in terms of uh, almost half of our vaccine stock is acquired from BioNTech. So uh, if um, indeed we could uh, verify that they have a particular uh, view about us also accessing uh, the, uh, the technology and the, the know-how, uh, I'm sure between ourselves and our colleagues in um, uh, at Accelerator, uh, we will be able, together with the WHO and, and uh, Minister, uh, the government of, of Belgium and other countries, uh, Norway, who we work uh, very closely, uh, I'm sure we will be able to tackle that. We will not uh, actually allow any private company uh, to protect its uh, interests by uh, preventing uh, others from accessing uh, knowledge and, 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 and know-how. The question of the um, Sinovac, yes, uh, both Sinovac and currently recently Sinopharm from China have been approved by SAPRA. Uh, this just opens the way for more uh, variety in terms of the number of vaccines which we can we can use. Um, hopefully, uh, as you asked whether uh, there will be more people, hopefully, uh, and more vaccines. But I think one should hasten to say from the uh, government side, um, the reality nevertheless at this stage is that because of the way in which the other two, the J and J and and uh, um, and, and and the Pfizer BioNTech uh, vaccines had already advanced in their approval and trial state stages, we committed and signed agreements, and at this stage, we still have sufficient stock for boosters, for um, you know new uh, vaccinations, so it will take a while that we will be looking for, you know, if it had come earlier, we would have diversified, as we remember, as I said, we started with uh, AstraZeneca. Um, but at this stage, we are happy to have a widespread of, of opportunities. Uh, I'm sure, as you would know, the, in those who are in, uh, in, the, in the business talk about you know, the supply and demand. So if there are more suppliers, if there are more participants, hopefully as we move forward, I know there was a question which I am happy to to leave to uh, Dr. Tedros about how many more boosters. Um, but as it becomes clear that as the variants multiply, we need more, clearly somewhere down the line, even the stock which we have, once it's, uh, it's, it's, it's running lower, we will be able to then have a better you know, uh, uh, kind of variety of vaccines which we can uh, access. Uh, I think uh, those which uh, could deal with the uh, program director will end there, and I'm happy to defer to uh, uh, DG and others uh, to deal with the more difficult ones. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, Thanks very much, uh, Minister Pasha, uh, Minister Belgium. Uh, the um, uh, issue of sharing with the big farm. Thank you for your question. Voilà. Thank you for your question. Um, the position of Belgium is clear. Um, the vaccine should be a public, public good. And uh, like I said, uh, the discussion of the patent waiver, we are having this more than two years now, and we are not a step ahead. We didn't, the only um, conclusion that we can say today that everyone is open for dialogue. So, but we are two years later and we all invested uh, public uh, money to develop uh, vaccines. So vaccines should be a public good, but 
after two years in a pandemic and we are seeing that the discussion of the patent waiver are not moving. So we didn't uh, sit still and we went searching for another solution. Um, and that doesn't mean that the discussion about the patent wa wave has to stop. Uh, I think it has something that has to go on and uh, never waste a good crisis. We have to learn from this. There are things that we didn't know, and then, but there are also a lot of things that we know now. Um, and I think um, and then we have to take lessons about it. So um, we are active in this uh, in this discussion, but at the same time, as we see that is not uh, progressing, we are uh, searching other solution. Like I said, we donated uh, 11 million vaccines through COVAX. So that's one vaccine for each uh, Belgian citizens. But um, like I said, uh, I'm looking for a structural solution. For me, it's a kind of charity. Uh, it is a solution on short term, uh, but it's better to do this than nothing. And at the same time, uh, we have uh, other companies like Universal. It's a company in Belgium who is also uh, in contact with Afrigen, and they are working also in Senegal to help the the countries uh, for, with the local production, and they are sharing their know-how and their knowledge uh, to produce local uh, vaccines um, and we are also investing with uh, our bio our uh, development bank uh, we have uh, also the gng uh, what is uh, produced in in south africa is uh, an investment with our uh, development bank but uh, if we really want a structural solution then i think that the thing that we visit today um that's a um, in my eyes, a better solution than the patent waiver, because you make the country self-resilient, and you, there is a there is a formula, and it is open. And does it mean that there will not there will no be no cooperation with the pharma? Yes, it, we we have to work together. It is uh, it is uh, complementary, and this project shows what has to be done earlier two years ago. But I'm happy that today we can say there is a solution and we are making some progress. Thank you very much, Minister T.G. Uh, Tedros. Thank you. Um, I mean, these are uh, very important questions, maybe starting from African Medicines Agency, uh, from the inception of the idea. I was uh, Minister of um, uh, Foreign Affairs actually at the time. I, I was very supportive uh, because uh, common platforms or continental um, uh, institutions are important uh, because there are many uh, shared issues in, in, in our continent that has to be addressed uh, through unison. So Africa Medicines Agency is, is one. Um, and this follows, by the way, the experience from the European Medicines Agency uh, that helped uh, actually in bringing uh, the whole union uh, together, even in reducing the funding or the amount of money they invest in um, individual uh, approvals, because the common approval cuts uh, uh, you know, uh, costs at, at uh, the uh, country level approval that's that's done. But not only that, when you talk about medicines, you, you know about counterfeit, and, uh, forged and poor quality, and uh, each and every country cannot fight this. It's, it's cross-border. So uh, the African Medicines Agency uh, can help uh, fight this also. Uh, there are many things that I can outline and its benefits, but that's why WHO has been supporting the establishment of it, uh, not only technically, uh, but we even did something that we do rarely financially. Normally, we are, we support tech, we give technical support, but to Africa Medicines Agency, we we provided including financial support, uh, and we helped also in pushing for the ratification. Uh, and I believe that this institution will be very, very important for the continent. I remember, and I was telling them a story earlier today, uh, when I proposed Africa CDC in 2013 in Abuja, some people laughed at me. <laughs> I had good reason uh, to recommend, um, and but it may not be 
clear for, for, for some people or some countries. But now I see um, there is a continent-wide support to Africa CDC. But it took many years for many people to understand its 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 benefits so i see the same thing with uh, with africa medicines agency the same resistance and the same doubts and the same concerns that i know africa medicine Af africa medicines agency will be as beneficial as africa cdc uh, so i would like to use this opportunity actually to all countries who have been ratified to ratify, speed up the establishment, strengthen it, and then it should go up and running uh, to, um, you know, contribute uh, to Africa's uh, well-being and 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 improvement in in health conditions. So it, it's late to be honest. It should have been done yesterday. And I encourage all countries to ratify and uh, use uh, the Africa Medicines Agency. But not only Africa Medicines Agency, you have Africa CDC, and you have also partnership for um, vaccine manufacturing in Africa, um, PMVA. Uh, um, and there is a need also for other continental institutions. So I think we need to identify and establish the continental institutions that can bring us all together because there are individual issues, but there are also shared issues. The world is now becoming more interdependent, more intertwined. So that's why the, the continental and global institutions are more important than, than before. And then on the BMJ uh, article, um, I, I would like us to focus on maybe what we're doing in the hub and what also BioNTech and uh, Kenup are, are doing. Um, to be honest, we need both. So forget about what <laughs> they have said or they have done and focus on what do they want to do. Mm -hmm. They're partnering with countries, I think three countries, um, who would like to start with fill and finish, start production and, and move on and have increased the availability of vaccines. Is that bad? It's not, it's good. So they can do that. And then the hub, we're doing the hub. If they could do the technology transfer, the uh, intellectual property, we're pushing for that. It can cut the... Uh, a period we need, as um, Petra is telling us uh, this morning, and I said it in my in my speech. Uh, so, uh, if those companies can give us for this biohab, it can cut the amount of time we need to go to the finish line. Even if they don't, still, it can take time, but it will be done. But more importantly, this hub is a strategic investment. Strategic investment to boost local production in low and middle income countries. It's not only the South Africa hub, but we have the spokes also in Brazil, in Argentina, Indonesia, and 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 elsewhere, all over. That really going to be boost or build local production, meaning it will address the equity issue, meaning it will really strike straight on the monopoly issue, which is causing the supply demand. Uh, problems, and then, of course, the equity. So this can also go ahead and should go ahead, and the companies, the uh, BioNTech or others, should support that. Not only COVID, by the way, malaria, HIV, TB, we say this isn't a strategic investment in low- and middle-income countries. So I, they, they can live together. It's not either or. It's both. So whatever extra things they, they speak, <laughs> to be honest, it doesn't matter. Uh, but they have to really see, I um, remind all of us, that we need both. Okay, they move, fill and finish, and bring some products now, and we vaccinate, good. And then there, this also investment that will have a serious uh, solution, strategic solution, we should invest in that, yes. So we need both. Why do we even say either or? So my message is 
I mean, I, I, I read it as, as you, others, whether it's Kenwoop or BioNTech or whoever, they, that's what my message is. That too can be done together. And I have seen the strong commitment countries. I have to start with the fill and finish and work with the BioNTech. Fine, is it, it's not wrong. And then we do the strategic also, which is which can be done. So it, it can be it can be done side by side. And I think it's better if we focus on these issues. And what can we get also to, um, uh, you know, um, improve uh, health? Uh, I mean, that that's the main aim, finally. And the contribution of all of us will be very, very important. Then on um, WHO's position, um, on the um, uh, epidemic pandemic, our expectation is that this pandemic, the acute phase of this pandemic will end this year. Of course, with one condition, meaning the 70% uh, vaccination by mid this year, around June, July. Uh, so, uh, if that can be done, the acute phase can 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 uh, really end, and that's what we're we're expecting. It's in our hands, and that's why we were saying it's not a matter of chance; it's a matter of choice. So, if the world wants to end it, it has the means to end it. If it wants to continue to be greedy and doesn't want to end it, then it will not end. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. So we will continue to play hide and seek with this uh, virus, and the virus will have safe haven to, um, you know, evolve. Then uh, South Africa will not stop detecting. They have incredible system. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no, we are happy you detected that transparency. And as soon as the world tried to punish you, we said no. This behavior should be rewarded, not punished. You know, identify variants, report immediately is a behavior that should be rewarded, not punished. And you have done really well. I think you have, you, you followed the debate, the whole world. It's a, ultimately, slowly but surely came to your side saying South Africa has done the right thing and it has to be rewarded, not punished. And those who have done something unnecessary, you know, the travel ban, I think they changed their mind and, and shifted uh, so, which is which is really good. So, continue to 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 be transparent, and that's what we should uh, encourage others also also to do. But what I'm saying is, the delay in our actions, or the delay in the 70% vaccination rate, will give the the virus a chance. New variants may emerge, and then that's another problem. Then back to another wave. So. Uh, I think we have to, we have now uh, all the tools at hand, uh, we have to uh, deliver and uh, uh, finish because the whole world is, to be honest, uh, sick and tired. Uh, then on when do we time to unmask? To be honest, mask, um, of course, um, when you're told to do it, you would uh, feel a bit, um, it's a bit difficult, but I think in the future it may continue to be a part of our culture. It uh, can prevent also the seasonal things once, you know. Uh, so um, I think doing it, it doesn't um, hurt. It, it can only benefit. Uh, so uh, maybe doing it, uh, a culture may, may help and the hand hygiene the same and other things the same. Uh, but for unmask to time to unmask, I don't think we need to have a deadline. To be honest, if the acute, even after the acute phase is gone, it's better to be careful. You know, being cautious is, is really important. Um, what we really missed during the lockdowns and all the serious, very severe measures was we couldn't even come together. We couldn't even say goodbye to when loved ones were departing. And, um, you know, people cannot go to a stadium and so on to have time, good time together. So, you know, having a mask and so on, it's individual level doesn't mean anything if we can do all the social things we want, the gatherings we want, and, uh, um, you know, working together, coming to office that we want and, and, and so on. Um, then on boosters, 
Um, you know, on the the anti-vax, of course, there is serious movement. There is misinformation. There is disinformation. Um, and we are working with tech industries to address that. Um, but the social media is is really uh, not helping. Uh, we were in the, as I said earlier, in the taxi, vaxi taxi, vaxi. Vaxi taxi. Vaxi taxi. Yeah. And we asked them what, you know, from what you have observed, what are the reasons behind people not do not want to be vaccinated? They told us you know, one is religion and the other one is um, fear. Uh, and mainly is what they pick from the social media. By the way, they told us one very interesting thing also. Some people are afraid of needles and the mo the mostly in men. <laughs> so they don't like me needles. So um, anyway, the reason I'm raising this is we have been discussing this issue also with the president. I think the behavioral inside part of what we do is really weak. We have to understand, really in, in integrate behavioral science into all that we do. You cannot convince people without understanding what's uh, behind you know, the uh, uh, problem we're facing, mainly the behavioral issues. So we have already started in WHO and we will build capacity in countries. And I think this is for the long term, there is a need for investment in behavioral science, which is really neglected. So the social, the anthropology, you know, it's just physicians, these or doctors and public health, you know, that epidemiology and so on, then we don't go beyond that. But we need the social scientists, we need the anthropologists, we need the behavioral scientists. And it, 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 I think that angle is, is less investment and we need to have more investment to address and this anti-vax can even can be defeated, I think, through that, uh, through that uh, approach. On booster, our focus now is, of course, booster is important, but many countries we have, we are now getting information more than 70% of deaths are those who have not even vaccinated ones. And most of hospitalizations also the same. So we need to start with vaccinating the unvaccinated rather than boosting the already vaccinated, still missing out on a large population unvaccinated who don't want to be vaccinated because of several reasons. And there's some countries who are succeeding now in doing really house to house um, outreach and understanding the reason, especially um, the senior citizens and people who, is, who have comorbidity and so on, and make sure that they are vaccinated. And when they do that, they see the number of cases and deaths really decoupling because those who are vulnerable and, uh, you know, who have a risk of uh, severe disease and deaths, if they are vaccinated, I think the first, second round for them is more important than booster. Of course, then the booster comes and the booster will be again for the vulnerable uh, vulnerable uh, groups. How long does it continue with us? I think it depends on how the virus evolves. Uh, so it's very difficult to, uh, to say, but what we're investing now with the biohab, if the affordability of the vaccines continues, and then that will be an opportunity actually to uh, boosters or follow-up vaccinations because the affordability improves and the supply and demand problem is is addressed and that's why we're investing in South Africa as a hub and also in uh, spokes in many parts many countries throughout throughout the world so sorry I took my time to uh, go into some detail but uh, uh, thank you so much just wanted to use the opportunity Thank you very much uh, to the responses to the question. I'm happy to take one question, and there's one question from the media, and then I'll have to unfortunately request uh, my counterpart, TG, to, to close. Maybe if it's going to be brief, ma'am, let's take you and the lady at the back. I think it's Artie. Uh, please, let's be brief now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Valerie, uh, yeah, I have a question for Dr. Tedros. If you see now, you look back two years of the management of the pandemic, 
what are your main, if you have three regrets in the way it was managed, and one question specific. Do you think lockdown was a mistake? Do you advocate lockdown for countries like South Africa and Africa? Don't you think it was a mistake when you see the huge economic and social damage that was caused by lockdowns? Yeah. No, thank you. No. Yeah. So maybe I will start from the last one on on lockdowns. I mean, or other measures. There is no like one size fits all approach that we have proposed. We left it up to countries to see their situation and take tailored measures up to them. Tailored measures. So should follow their their situation. Um, and from country to country, forget about country to country, even in one country, from one uh, province to the other, from one district to the other, there are differences from ca one co county to the other. You cannot have like a blanket coverage of one measure. Uh, it varies. So I think um, even going forward, some places, maybe if a lockdown is necessary uh, based on the situation, maybe some countries may go back to that. That they have to really understand and assess their, their situation. Um, lockdowns affect the economy. Uh, and it's, it's when it's really a must and you don't have any choices that you use it. It's really unwanted uh, action, to be honest. Uh, but you would be forced to take that because you have no other option. Now, with vaccines, with all the tools we have, I don't think anyone is doing it, and I don't expect that lockdowns will, will happen because we have the tools. We know the virus very well. We know it better, and um, uh, it's evolving also, and um, less severity and so on. And we have the tools, the vaccines and so on. So I don't expect, uh, to be honest, lockdowns, even that is uh, not the case throughout the world now. Uh, the world is really sick and tired. So glad that we have at least removed, uh, we're removing that one, one thing. But that's a very last resort that countries use, last, last, when they have no means. And this is before even the advent of the vaccines. And then on the, what we can, maybe what we can learn, I can uh, take it that way. Um, you know, as a, as a global uh, community, even now we are not prepared. Uh, we are not ready for another uh, pandemic. We have learned a lot, relatively better off, but still I would say we are not, uh, not prepared. And one of the problems from the start was, even in high income countries, the investment in cutting edge technology, especially in medicine was very, very high. And the world has really done, progressed a lot in terms of innovation for high tech medicine, medical interventions, even robotics and so on. While investment in very simple public health, ABCs, was really uh, not not there. Um, I remember when Ebola, my, the first two years of my term, by the way, as WHO, we were fighting Ebola in DRC. It's um, North Kivu, for people who know it. It's an unstable area. More than 18 uh, armed groups operate, and we even lost two of our colleagues that were killed and many other damages. But within that environment, we were contact tracing 25,000 people. While in a very high income country, very developed, they couldn't even do contact tracing of some thousands, meaning the public health was neglected. It's not because they don't have capacity, but the lack of attention. So I think this should be a revival of, of public health, the simple things that should be done, starting from surveillance, the, you know, the, of course, you should start preparedness, the surveillance, early detection, response, and the whole force, the whole army you need for that should be in, in, in place. So I think that's one uh, area where I think need uh, some progress. And the second is, uh, we, we don't have still a uh, rule of game or um, an agreement or a treaty, if you like. To govern a country, you need rule of law. You can't govern a country if you don't have a law. 
And for a shared problem like this common threat, you need to have some rules of the game. Otherwise, it cannot be governed like the pandemic, which was going out of control because no country feels obliged because there is no obligation because obligation comes from law. There should be do this or don't do this. That's why we're pushing for treaty. Of course, there is IHR, but that's the small part of uh, response, uh, you know, that can be covered through IHR. So I think we need to have a law also that governs so that we don't have another anarchy, to be honest. And, uh, you know, the, the world when there is a common threat responds in a very uh, predictable way. So people know what to do and what not to do. That's why we're pushing for for a treaty. Um, and, and these are the two. Then the third is um, surveillance. That's why, by the way, we have established now the Berlin hub. So another hub, we have MRNA hub here, and then Ber Berlin hub is collaborative intelligence. Uh, we mainly depend on a few um, nodes globally, like maybe government information and so on in terms of surveillance. Uh, but we need to bring all institutions together and there should be collaborative intelligence um, and the genomic and so on also will, will be part of it. Um, and, um, you know, all information should really be uh, taken uh, seriously and um, uh, it starts from, by the way, uh, that collaborative intelligence to protect the world. Uh, but I don't want to go into details, but that's where one of the weaknesses we have seen uh, where we should, we should improve. Uh, and I can go on and on in other uh, areas, but I think these are the three. Maybe we need to go ahead, we go back and try to learn from the Mekong region. They did really better. Even now they're 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 okay uh, because it could be the muscle memory uh, they had the SARS experience and uh, they responded quickly. So I hope the world has a muscle memory now and it will respond in a better way. But still uh, documenting that experience and uh, learning from this and um, uh, you know using that for for the future will be will be very important. I mean, these are the three I, I, can, I can say. But final one story I would like to share with you is um, uh, <clears throat> on the what happened when we first heard. Maybe stories that nobody says, uh, but stories that can inspire. And that inspired me and even gave me energy in uh, the initial stage. The Wuhan municipality posted a report in its website saying there is a new disease. And then our Beijing office detected that. And then passed it over to our regional office through that to our uh, headquarters. And the day was December 31, 2019, meaning a New Year Eve. These guys didn't say, OK, it's a New Year Eve. Let's go dancing. It can wait. They didn't. They knew it was serious, and they were very cautious. They passed it. And then they processed the information on a New Year Day. That's January 1, 2020. And then on January 2nd, it was verified, confirmed that this is a new disease. It took them less than 48 hours in the middle of a New Year. That's New Year Eve, New Year, and the day after the new year, when many people are already down because of hangover. <laughs> but uh, that inspired me because they didn't leave it because it's a new year eve or it's a new year. They did their job. Then I said, OK, I have a good team. We can do this together, I think. You know, we, they're working in good phase. And this pandemic fighting it is really going to be OK with such kind of a team, but it has been difficult two years. Uh, the, all the stuff has been affected and the stress, the pressure you can, you can imagine. Uh, but I think um, um, we benefited from the 2014 Ebola outbreak that helped us to change some things in, in WHO. And I can say that during COVID, it was better prepared. And then 
we have introduced other changes. That's, again, believe WHO is better prepared. And member states are now agreeing also to strengthen it further. And we hope they will strengthen because it's, it's their institution. And one of them is uh, with me here, Minister Kitter. That's why we came uh, together. Uh, but just wanted to share that that uh, story and that we have to be serious about pandemics, even if it's a New Year or New Year Eve. <laughs> any event, any signal has to be taken seriously. And that's what we will we will continue to do. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you'll agree with me that we can continue for the whole evening on this subject. Let's take three messages with ourselves that every dark cloud has a silver lining. And out of this pandemic, let's explore new ways of making sure that low medium, uh, low medium income countries can benefit from the technology transfer. And that through this mRNA tech hub, where South Africa, the rest of the continent, and other partners from the rest of the world demonstrate the working together of research institutions, uh, universities, science councils, private sector, Africa, African and BioVac in South Africa is perhaps a new model that should be explored. And that this is done in partnership with a number of partners, EC, World Health Organization, Germany, France, Belgium, Norway, Canada. So all of these are new ways in which we need to look at how we address the challenges of society in the future. So with those uh, three concluding messages, I'd like to invite uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Sandy Lubuteleza, to do the vote of thanks. And uh, from my side, thank you again for your cooperation. Thank you uh, very much, um, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Mjahad, DG for DSI. Um, just to share with you, Dr. Mjwaha is the most senior DG in government, and he's a dean of FOSAT. Um, so uh, thanks for, um, for all the work you've done, starting from uh, guiding on the preparations uh, for the visit with all your teams, uh, Dr. Mufe, uh, on my side, Dr. Crisp, uh, and all the teams that worked with the Belgian team, and also the team from the WHO, under the leadership of uh, Dr. Owen Kalua. And, um, one thing that came up here is that strong uh, uh, leadership is what is very important as we do the work. And for that, I'd like to thank the leadership of Dr. Tetros at the WHO uh, for all the leaders. Uh, I mean, he actually uh, led from the front um, uh, when um, the whole epidemic started, um, uh, also working with the different offices. And for us, here is our WHO regional office under Dr. Moeti, and then our local office under Dr. Owen Kalua. I mean, as a country, we're one of the major beneficiaries uh, in terms of the support, getting the teams to support us on the ground up to today uh, we still have teams from WHO that are supporting us but more importantly for driving this initiative and thank you Dr. Tetros for showing confidence in our country uh, in our capabilities uh, in our academic and scientific expertise and we really appreciate that also on the leadership I'd like to thank uh, our political leadership present here today uh, Dr. Joe Pasha my boss uh, and uh, my other boss here uh, uh, Deputy Minister Manamela, South African government displayed a lot of leadership. I mean, from the president to the top, um, uh, uh, from the president going down, uh, we had leadership, we had NCCC every week, we never slept, we had midnight meetings. Actually, as I'm looking at Glenda now, when we're talking about, uh, when my minister mentioned the issue of AstraZeneca, uh, when we got the bad news after that press release on Novavax and the, uh, and, and the AstraZeneca by the team of Shapir Mati and them, Glenda said, wait, I think there's something we can do. She phoned the former minister, and the same night we met Dr. Uh, Stoffels uh, to discuss the, the, the program of how to actually 
save the situation of that AstraZeneca. And I can tell you, the team uh, led by Glenda uh, and uh, working with Linda Gale Baker and, and the other scientists worked on the protocols, we worked on the budgets, and I know when we, we were, and the stocks were moved over all to the central point, we had to, sh uh, we, we, we had to charter a flight, we had to work with Treasury, get money. It was such a lot of work, but again, every day the president had personal interest. The minister had personal interest. And committees and triple C, IMC on vaccine led at the at the center and the nucleus of government guided, and we knew that we had to be up. So that leadership was very important from the WHO, but from the government here, but also being guided by the Afro regional office. Thank you very much to all the collaboration from uh, uh, the other countries. Uh, the minister did mention that we don't work in a vacuum. Uh, uh, we are part of a broader ecosystem. And, um, and we thank the minister here. Uh, uh, the minister from uh, uh, Belgium, uh, but also we have other um, uh, European countries uh, present here today, the members of the diplomatic corps. We really appreciate all the support that uh, we have been getting uh, uh, as a country in responding, uh, the, the, the support uh, and all the work that, that is there. But of course, uh, uh, WHO, if we did not have the kind of leadership, academic and scientific leadership in the country, they wouldn't have had um, uh, the courage to come to us. Let me thank our host here, Professor De Villiers, uh, other professors here, my friend Tulio. Uh, he didn't tell me that he was leaving KZN until I met him here, but anyway, he's still part of the team. I mean, we had to wake him up at night and sometimes to come and present, because I mean, this thing is presenting that this protein spark is like this, and then this is like that. So we had said, look, come, come and tell the president. We're not going to be able to explain this. And you know, I was saying something to my colleague that they something with politicians and liking to work at night. <laughs> so, so some NCCC meetings will meet at nine o'clock in the evening and would get him up uh, to say, please come and present. They'll come as a team and they'll be able to really narrate. But what's more nice about South African scientists that have enjoyed? You know, they, when they explain, they make science seem so easy and understandable and would actually even take them to media briefings so that they are able to talk to the normal people on the ground. I think that is very important. But also as we, we move on all the other leadership of the institutions uh, from SERI, from AfriGene, from BioVec, Africa City, and all that. We really thank you for all the work. I think this is a start. I think the epidemic has allowed us to unleash our potential. And it actually gave us a bit of energy to move faster than we were moving as we we're moving forward. And thank you very much for that. Then coming on to the actual implementation, we thank the leadership in the provinces in terms of the work that has been done. And uh, we've got our MEC here, Minister Mbombo, uh, in the Western Cape, and I'm sure she's representing her other colleagues. At National, we actually don't have facilities. Facilities are in provinces. So those are the people that do the work. We can just guide in terms of policy. Health is a concurrent competence in South Africa between National and the provinces. And that work is important. We can do and push, but they actually get the staff to do the work uh, and ensure that we move on uh, and, uh, with all what uh, 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 with all what needs to be done. I cannot thank uh, again once more the, uh, our team, uh, led by Dr. Chris National as a project leader for the vaccination program, being able to uh, whilst we handle the political uh, the politics and everything, to deal with all the calls from Tulio, from Glenda, from from, uh, from uh, uh, Professor Terry Blanche and all the other people around to ensure that work goes on as we move ahead. And everyone is very important, and we thank you for making time, but more importantly, members of the media, uh, we know you ask difficult questions. Sometimes we don't respond, but it's very important for accountability that we are able to tell our communities what we are doing, where we're not doing right, and we need to be transparent. You are one very transparent government, and we thank you for being with us, and we still believe that tomorrow will still be part of all the proceedings uh, as, as the team is will be going uh, to the other sides. And thank you very, uh, very much for everyone for being here and for being part of the visit. Thank you.